Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what a gracious God to look down on our plight, to see our desperate need to have pity on those who not only were sinners by nature and by activity, but in our sin, we were rebellious against you, taking all that you had given us as good gifts by your creative hand and your providential care and spurning you. Lord, we had no ability to turn to you in faith, to love you as you are worthy, to honor you, and you look down on us in that miserable condition. Helpless, hopeless, lost, dead in transgressions and sins, guilty, and you loved. You sent your son uh, that we might know you, uh, that we might have a, a witness to your love, to your kindness, to your long suffering, your patience, and also a window into your justice as you sent your son to be crucified in the place of sinners to satisfy your justice and forgive the guilty. Lord, to these things we are infinitely indebted. We turn now to your word and ask that you would be magnified as we listen. Give us soft hearts. Give us ears to hear. And would you operate inside of us by your Holy Spirit to be yielded unto your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This is an exciting Sunday for us. Uh, partly because you can already smell lunch and the wafting of carne asada. Secondly, because our kids are not dismissed, and so there will be extra fidgeting and squirming and noises, and that is A-OK. This is a family day for us. We're thrilled to be together. Uh, We are glad to eat together, um, and we're glad to welcome new members into the body of Christ. And so uh, this is thrilling for us. It's also fitting then that we're in this series called Caring for Each Other in the Body of Christ. Uh, This is something of a practical ecclesiology, and I have up on the screen for you sort of the outline series so you can see where we are. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at Ephesians 4.16 and what it means that you play your part in the health and growth of the church. And last week and this week, we're in Hebrews chapter 10, and we're finding out that, yes, indeed, you are your brother's keeper. We will move, if the Lord wills, in the following weeks to Galatians 6 and look at what kind of condition our heart needs to be in for spiritual restoration of others. And then we'll look at our character in 2 Timothy 2, the character required for church challenges. And we'll move from there into seeing our role in church discipline and then in the restoration process of church discipline and then seeing our role in diffusing factions. That's sort of a roadmap for where we are and where we're headed in this series. And last week, we looked specifically at the dangers of apostasy from Hebrews chapter 10. Apostasy is that falling away of a follower of Jesus Christ. Apostasy is the deliberate and permanent departure from following Jesus. There are those who follow Jesus for a time, and then they stop following him. That is a reality throughout church history. It was a reality in the days of the New Testament in its writing, and it's a reality in our own day. The danger of apostasy is very real, and the letter to the Hebrews that we began looking at last week and we'll look at again this morning, the entirety of that letter, it's something of a a sermon in letter form, serves as a warning against falling away. And the primary implement that the writer of the Hebrews uses to encourage us not to fall away is to arm us with the reality of the superiority of Jesus Christ. The theme of the book of Hebrews is Jesus is better. He's better than angels. He's better than the Mosaic Covenant. He's better than the high priests and all of the sacrifices that made up the sacrificial system. He is better than the created order which he himself made and spoke into existence and sustains. And Jesus is better than everything you're tempted to go back to. He's better than the personal comforts you might be tempted to follow and have if you were to abandon Jesus. Listen, if I stop confessing Jesus publicly, my life will get easier. Uh, My family might accept me again. I might get my job back. I might get my home back. I might get my stuff back. That was the audience in the first century. I could go back to the old ways and, and life would be easier again. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says, Jesus is better than everything you're tempted to go back to. And Christian, as you think about your old life, if you're ever nostalgic, stop. Jesus is better. 
That's the theme of the book of Hebrews, and and that arms us against falling away. And and the question we were asking last week is, whose responsibility is it to not wander away from Jesus? Is it Jesus' responsibility to keep you? Yes. Is it the Father's purpose and plan to keep the elect? Yes. Is it the Holy Spirit's personal task indwelling every genuine believer to keep and preserve and seal? Yes. And is it your responsibility, Christian, to persevere? To keep yourself in the faith, to make it to the end. Biblically, yes. And then finally, is it all of our responsibility to watch out for one another? And the answer in Hebrews 10 is, yes, you are your brother's keeper. We looked at the danger of apostasy, warnings against apostasy, the causes of apostasy, and the protections from apostasy. And that lands us back here in this chapter. I pointed out to you the the connection between Hebrews 10, 25, and 26. Hebrews 10, 25 talks about us not forsaking the assembly and encouraging each other. And then verse 26 begins with this little conjunction, the word for. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer a sacrifice of sins, but only the expectation of a fury of the fire of God that will consume his adversaries. And the connection between our being together and encouraging each other and the reality of apostasy is clear in this text. We must do some things to maintain our faith together because apostasy is serious. That is what this passage is about in its whole. We spent some time looking at what this would have meant for the first century hearers of this sermon letter. And what I want to do today is examine the details of these verses a little more thoroughly. In fact, we're going to back up to verse 19 because verses 19 to 25 in the original is all one sentence. Verses 26 and 27 are all one sentence. And these two long sentences are joined together. So we're going to back up a little farther than we did last week. Back to verse 19. I want to turn your attention to God's word, to Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19. Follow along with me as I read. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, And then notice this string of commands, verse 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with a pure pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And verse 24. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sins, but a terrifying expectation of a judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. This is God's word. This is a word we need. I'm convinced that the warnings of Scripture serve as a means of God keeping His elect. It's in the Bible written to professing believers for a reason. But we need to hear these words. We need to hear these encouragements. And we need to lock in in our relationships with one another. God commands interdependent vigilance. Because apostasy brings dire consequences. That's sort of a twofold statement of what this passage is about. God commands interdependent vigilance. We'll see three commands he gives in 10, 19 to 25. And God commands these things because apostasy brings about dire consequences. Let's look first at this interdependent vigilance. In verse 19, all the way down through verse 25, we have one long sentence, and it includes three major commands. Let us, let us, let us. And those commands can be summarized this way. Draw near to God, hold tight to hope, and stir up each other. That'll be the framework for looking at this first section. And all of these commands begin with the phrase, let us. There's no good way in English to command all of us together, we, to do something. 
Uh, let us kind of sounds like permission. But the reality is, this is, these are commands, they are exhortations, and it ought to sound something like this. All of us together do do these three things. Draw near to God, hold tight to hope, stir up each other. And the fact that this is introduced with the let us, this is about all of us together, means that there is an individual component to these commands, but there is a corporate reality to these as well. All of us believers together are to draw near to God through Christ in faith. And all of us as believers together are to hold tight to the hope that this faith produces. And then all of us together are to stir one another up to love and good deeds. Being together and speaking to one another. Christ is superior to everything you're tempted to go back to. But the temptations to resort to what is comfortable... The temptations to be spiritually lax, the temptations to be distracted, uh, the temptations to drift in unbelief are very real. They are real because of external pressures and they are real because of internal residual sin in each one of us. We truly are a threat to ourselves and we need one another. So here are three means of maintaining enduring faith together. These are God's means God-given commands with an individual and a corporate purpose. The first one is found there in verse 22. Let us draw near with a sincere faith, in a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith. This command is summarized this way, draw near to God. And there are motivations on either side of this command. The first motivation is given in verse 19 to 21. And, and there, the motivation to draw near to God is that we have access through Jesus Christ. Notice the therefore in verse 19. Therefore, brethren. The fact that the, the writer here says brethren is a marker. This is a significant change or transition in the book. And the therefore basically summarizes everything in Hebrews 1 through uh, one, chapter 1 verse 1 all the way through chapter 10 verse 18. Basically the whole book up to this point comes down to this climactic point. Therefore, do these things. And what has been summarized up to this point is the superiority of Jesus Christ and up through chapter 10, the superiority of Christ as the only way to God. Jesus Christ is our access to God, and therefore Christ is better than everything else. Interspersed in the argument of the writer are all these warnings about unbelief, about wavering in faith. And here, we are to have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Verse 19. This confidence here is a reference to authority. We are authorized to enter in and have free access to God himself. And the picture is given here of the, the Old Testament system and the holy place. The holy place was the inner sanctum of the tabernacle and later the temple. And only the high priest was allowed to enter that place. And only the high priest was allowed to enter once a year. It was closed off. The, the, the very manifest presence of God was serious business. To violate any of these injunctions for anybody to go in there or for the high priest to enter in the wrong way or with unconfessed sin or at the wrong time meant death. This was serious to come into the presence of a holy God. And the only way required authorization and only one entrant. And there was a curtain a dramatic physical separation between the people and the manifest presence of God. That was the old way. There is a new way inaugurated by Jesus Christ. And this text tells us that Jesus Christ is the curtain. Look at verse 20. This new and living way, which Jesus inaugurated for us through the veil. That's a word for curtain. And the curtain the author is talking about here is Jesus' flesh. So instead of one high priest once a year going through the giant curtain to have manifest access or direct access to the manifest presence of God, Jesus Christ is now the veil through which all believers pass and have direct access to God himself. This is the great privilege of being a Christian. And notice verse 21, we have a great high priest over the house of God. Jesus is the high priest. 
Every generation of Israel before, since Mosaic law, had a great high priest, uh, the, the one who would oversee this direct access to God. But they were all sinners and they all died and they had to sacrifice over and over and over again. All of those things were shadows pointing to the reality. Jesus Christ is the great high priest through whom all of us who believe have direct access to God. This is good news. Jesus' identity is our authorization. He was sinless. He didn't have to have his own sins paid for. And he opens up the way for us because his death was the final sacrifice to pay for sin. Notice this veil is his flesh. That is a reference to his death. And in verse 19, this entrance into the holy place is by his blood. That is Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross 2,000 years ago and died there, died not as an example, not as some sort of martyr or victim, but as the payment price for our sins to cancel our debts before God and make our way in. What does it mean to belong to Jesus Christ? It means you have the right, the freedom, the authority to enter into immediate fellowship with Almighty God. This also means that to refuse Christ is to refuse the only way in. If you reject Christ in this life, when you go and meet God in all of his might, you will be standing still with your sins unforgiven. And there is no sacrifice left for you, but only judgment. Let me ask you this, friend. Are you burdened by sin? Do you feel the weight and the reality of the fact that you're not perfect, that you can't live up to God's standards, that you actually can't set yourself free from a slavery, a bondage to darkness? Do you want to be free? Do you want to have life and light? Friend, it is found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Jesus, in going to the cross, took our darkness on himself and opened up a way, the only way to God. There is no other way to stand before God and not be consumed by his fury than to come through Jesus Christ. And so verse 22, we get this command, so let us draw near. What's the motivation for us to draw near? Jesus Christ has opened the way. So come to God. Come to him. Draw near to him. And notice what is said. Draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This clean inside and outside is most likely a reference to Ezekiel 36 and the promise that God by his spirit would do a supernatural work inside of you that would manifest itself on the outside. A Christian is one who has come to God by faith and has had a miracle done on the inside by the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit and is experiencing things he could never produce on his own. This is a work of God to clean inside and outside. And these are once for all time actions by God done to a believer. Look at uh, chapter 10, verse 14, just a few verses up the page. For by one offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Do you know what that means, Christian? In your coming through Christ to God, God perfects you. In other words, he he puts you in a standing of declared perfection. So that when God sees you, Christian, he does not see your sins anymore. He sees the perfection of his son, Jesus Christ, credited to your account. And he does this for all who are, and notice carefully in verse 14, all who are being sanctified. Listen, that's an admission that you're not perfect yet. That's an admission that you still carry sin with you. Christians sin. But Christians are forgiven and are declared by God in his grace to be perfect. That only comes by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But it is a radical reality. It means you, Christian, you come to God with bold assurance, with confidence that Jesus Christ has paid for all your sins, past, present, and future. And on that basis, God declares you to have never sinned at all and to always have done everything right. You're perfect. 
This is the gospel. So draw near. What a motivation. Spurgeon said this, When I come before the throne of God, I feel myself a sinner, but God does not look upon me as one, only by the blood of Christ. Christ has paid the penalty for your sins. He declares you perfect and is sanctifying you now. So draw near to him in full faith from the heart. This idea of full assurance, uh, this isn't the, the assurance of salvation like a subjective impression that you are a Christian. No, this is the full assurance that what faith gives you is perfect standing before God. This is the full assurance that faith and faith alone brings you into a right relationship with him. This is confidence in what Christ does and in what God promises. So draw near to God through faith. The second command that's given here as a means for us is to hold tight to hope. Look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. To hold fast speaks of the manner in which we cling to God through faith in Christ. Holding fast implies an ongoing struggle against opposing forces. Uh, This holding fast is tenacious. It's constant. It's putting forth an utmost strength. It is a white knuckle grip on Jesus Christ. Listen, it means the Christian life is not easy. Faith is not easy. And it requires a persistent clinging to Christ. And this is to be done without wavering. Notice verse 23. Not a back and forth tossed around like waves of the sea. This is a prohibition against trying to ride two horses at the same time. I want a little bit of Jesus and I want to continue to live with me in charge. I want to continue to live in the world. I want to continue to love sin. Cling without wavering. God or Baal, which one will you serve? Christ or the world? Loyalty to earthly things or a fidelity to eternal things that will never disappoint? And you can't have both. And he says, hold fast the confession of our hope. Confession here implies something that is public, not private. You can't be a private Christian. There is an outward declaration of the truth of the gospel and my personal investment in it. Uh, Not only a confession that Jesus Christ is the only way, but I have surrendered to Jesus Christ. And hold fast this confession. The first public confession of this by God's design is baptism. You, You come to the waters of baptism and say, I'm being dunked under these waters, immersed into Christ and raised to new life. That's a physical symbol of an inward reality. But it ought always to result in a public confession. And that confession goes not only at the start of that public confession in baptism, but continues through the whole of the Christian life. And we are to cling to that with a white knuckle grip. And it's interesting, this is a parallel passage to Hebrews 6.11, which speaks of the confidence of our faith. Here the same wording is used, except it is said, hold fast the confession of our hope. And and hope and faith are, are twins here. Hope is not wishful thinking in the New Testament. Hope is a confidence in what God has promised. A sure confidence in what God has promised. And there's a fortifying reason here to hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. Notice it in verse 23. For he who promised is faithful. What a great promise that is. This is fortifying. There is no reason in God for us to waver. There's no lack in the work of Christ. Listen, if God wavered, we would all be in trouble. But God makes promises and he always keeps them. This is a contrast to the promises that the old life makes. If you feel nostalgic about sins I sort of miss because I'm committed to holiness and following Christ. Listen, those sins make promises they can't keep. The promises that sin entices us with never come to fruition. Even the promises we make to God are not worth much. You may think of Peter promising, I will never deny you. But God's promises do not fail. Nothing compares to the promises of God for us in the gospel. Because God promised us things in the gospel when we were unworthy. And God is unflinchingly solid. He did the best for us when we were at our worst. 
And how will he not graciously also along with Christ give us all things? God is faithful, so hold fast to him. Listen, when, when we loosen our grip through unbelief, the deficiency is ours. A deficiency in our knowledge of him, a deficiency in our loyalty to him, the deficiency is never in God. Here's a third command, a third exhortation. Stir up each other. Stir up each other. Look at verse 24. Let us consider. And literally the the original here is, let us consider one another. I know in our English text, it looks like what we really need to think about is being irritating. Uh, Not yet. We'll irritate in a moment. But the original leads with consider one another. Think carefully about one another. The object of your careful consideration is the other brothers and sisters in this room. Give careful attention to each other. That just means that Christianity cannot be selfish. No rugged individualism. And then the text tells us, consider one another carefully unto what end? Unto, verse 24, stimulating one another to love and good deeds. This stimulating one another can be translated to to stir up, to provoke, or to agitate. And and normally it's a negative word. Every other time it's used in the New Testament and in Greek literature, it is negative. The other use in the New Testament is about an argument between believers. And if you think about it, it's easy for us to agitate one another, to provoke one another to anger, to be an irritant to each other. To get under each other's skin. And, and sometimes we do this intentionally. Find some weakness in a brother and, and exploit it to make the brother come down and make ourselves feel superior. And there's great irony here in using this word for agitation. It's a surprising kind of provocation. How, how are we to provoke one another? How are we to get under each other's skin? Love. Good deeds. And listen, you can't provoke someone to love and good deeds in an unloving way. (laughs) That just defeats all of it. You can't be unkind in these things. And so the irony here is, yeah, provoke one another. I'm good at that. Uh Ah, be a provocation unto love and good deeds. It really is striking. Instead of provoking each other to sadness or belittlement, We are to have an effect in each other's lives where our love, which ought to mark every Christian and our good deeds for which we've been prepared by God's grace to walk in, come out. If you've ever bought a pan of paint, a pan of paint, I don't even know what that is, a can of paint at the hardware store. And and you know, they, they put it in that machine, the agitator, and the machine shakes it up. And if you don't do that, what are you going to get out of the top of the can of paint? Water or oil. You're not going to get good pigmentation coverage and flow like you should. It must be stirred up and agitated. Have you ever put water on your hot dog? You know, when you take the mustard and the condensation is at the top and and you go, oh, and you just ruined a hot dog. What needed to happen? You, You got to take the jar of mustard and shake it up. That's the idea of the word here. In fact, we get an English word, paroxysms, from the Greek word used here. It's a medical term describing violent, agitated shaking. <laughs> and, and it's just amazing that a, a, such a negative word is used here in a positive way. We, we are to be in each other's lives, close enough, knowledgeable enough, intimately enough, even invasively enough to provoke these things. Selfless, sacrificial love. Followers of Jesus are to be known by love for one another. That's how they're to be marked out in the world. Notice in this section there is faith in the first command, hope in the second command, and then love in this command, that glorious triad of the Christian life, these things that remain. And then it is also to produce good works or deeds. These are Holy Spirit, God-produced, God-prepared efforts and labors that you and I participate in. What does that mean? If we are around each other in the right ways, then the effect will be, oh, there's a lack of love in my life. And my brother or my sister in Christ is going to be around me to provoke increased love, a refreshing of love, a reset on good works and good deeds. Is there lethargy? Is there laziness? 
we need to stir one another up. Notice verse 25, this pair of prerequisites to follow the command in verse 24. We have to be together and we have to speak to one another. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. First, we have to be together. The word forsake here is a a sad word. It's a word of abandonment or desertion. It is to leave something precious behind, something very important. What is that thing very important in this passage? Our gathering together. Don't abandon that. Don't leave that behind. And the word here for gathering together is based on the Greek word synagogue. That may sound familiar. The synagogue was the gathering place of the Jews. It's where they got together and listened to the word of God. It's where they got together and and worshiped corporately. It was their regular public visible gathering. And here it is used of the gathering of the church. And and originally that was carried out day by day, every day, according to Acts 2.46. But within the first generation of the church, it was the regular practice on the first day of the week, on the Lord's Day, or on Sunday mornings, according to Acts 20 and 1 1 Corinthians 16.2, first day of the week, a regular public gathering of believers. And this is where believers are together. We sit together under God's word. We, we, we hear the word read and we hear the word explained. We worship God together as one body in song. We participate in the ordinances of baptism in the Lord's table. We encourage one another. We minister to one another and where church discipline is practiced. And some in this original audience had made it their habit or their custom, their regular pattern to abandon the public gathering. Listen, this is bound up in maintaining your confession, maintaining the public proclamation of your hope was doing so in the community of the locally gathered church. And some have abandoned that due to any number of reasons, social pressures, financial pressures, family pressures, personal comfort, convenience, even persecution. Listen, a fear of suffering can produce this abandonment. Spiritual laziness can result in this abandonment and growing unbelief. Whatever the case may have been for any individual hearer of this encouragement, the encouragement is clear. Don't forsake it. John Owen says, where such neglect is frequent and where trivial diversions are embraced to avoid it, When we neglect this duty, the heart is not upright before God, and the man is on a path to perdition. That is actually the point of this passage. Forsaking the assembly reveals what is going on in the heart, some spiritual lethargy, or perhaps the seeds of unbelief altogether, and the end of that road is apostasy. It's interesting that the writer used the words for synagogue here, and then the the phrase house of God back in verse 21. I believe this is intentional language by the author as a contrast to the old way, the old way of Judaism. Jesus is the great high priest. He's better than the sacrifices that had gone before. Listen, that is a reminder that in the first iteration, the first audience, the first readers of these letters faced a very severe persecution for following Christ. It meant the breakup of families and the loss of finances. It meant the the taking away of the things that were comfortable. And so when life got hard, I want to go back to what's comfortable. And what is the author doing here by using the word synagogue and the house of God and Jesus as a high priest? He's saying, look, the, the real synagogue is the gathering together of God's people under Jesus. And the real house of God is not that big building downtown that casts a long shadow over these fledgling believers. And the real high priest is not the guy standing up with all the, the, the robes and the hats and all that stuff doing the ceremonies and the sacrifices. That is done. It's obsolete. The real house of God is the church. The real synagogue is God's gathered people. And the real mediator is Jesus the Christ. And listen, this was a tough sell in the first century. Because when the temple still stood until AD 70, you could see it. And friends, I I know it's easier to go along with what I can see than what I must believe by faith. And this is why we must cling to God in faith. And we must encourage one another in this. 
So how important was the public gathering for the first generation of Christians? Do you want to be like Israel, wandering in the wilderness, saying, I want to go back to Egypt. It was so great there. No, you were in slavery there. It was death. Don't abandon God. To to walk away from Christ, to, to walk away from the public assembly loyal to Christ. Because life got hard. Is to abandon everything. So for present day Christians, it's a, you can't just take or leave the public gathering. You can't take or leave the church. It's, it's not unimportant. You can't just get in the habit of missing church when it's inconvenient. Think about how easy it is for believers in this country, in this era, to gather together. If we find trivial diversions to take us away from the public gathering now, what will it be like when they take away our tax-exempt status? What will it be like when we don't have a building? What will it be like when it gets hard? What will it be like if it were illegal? You're associating with those narrow-minded whatevers? Okay, well, you can't work anymore. Can't have a job here. We'll shut you down on social media. What's it going to be like, Christian? (laughs) So being committed to the gathering now when it's easy is actually a test run of the temperature of your faith, clinging to God and his word, clinging to Christ as the only mediator, and clinging to our public confession together as a body of believers. We need each other in this. When it comes to the church, absence does not make the heart grow fonder. Absence makes the heart grow colder. And you know this. We've all felt this. What's required is vigilant interdependence. You were not designed to make it on your own. And I am running Omri right out of time to explain church membership. It's important. Church membership is really important. Omri, you prayed really long. I was counting the minutes. (laughs) Sorry, is that on tape? (laughs) Prayer's good. We have to speak to one another. Notice verse 25, encouraging one another. This word for encourage uh, carries the whole spectrum of a rebuke, a warning, an encouragement, and a comfort. As the need dictates, we encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. I won't take a lot of time on this. For the first century readers, there was a day drawing near when Jerusalem would be destroyed, the temple would be leveled, and there would no longer be a high priest or blood running out of the bottom of the building. What they thought would be comfortable to go back to would be decimated. And to this day, not one stone lies upon another. And there is another day, one that we will think of in our day, as that day draw nears, the day is shorthand for the day of the Lord, day of judgment, a day of God's reckoning, when he will have his way on the earth and his manifest glory will make war against his enemies and those who have rebelled against him. So encourage one another all the more as we see the day coming. God commands this vigilant interdependence. Why? Because apostasy brings dire consequences. This takes us through the transition into verses 26 and 27. What are those dire consequences? In verse 26, there's no coverage for sin if you leave Christ. And in verse 27, judgment is certain. I'll just read these verses. If we go on sinning willfully, this sin here is the knowing willful rejection of Christ after having professed faith in him. It is a present tense verb. It means this is ongoing. This is a persistent continuance in a direction away from loyalty to Christ. This is the insidious treason of apostasy. That's the sin that's described here. Christian, if you're surprised by trials, surprised by sin, and you're thinking, oh man, I sinned this morning on the way to the church, that's not what this verse is talking about. This is talking about a persistent, willful, intelligent, incessant walking away from Christ. Notice what's said about this. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Why is that? Because rejecting Christ is a sin, and there's no sacrifice that can pay for rejecting the only sacrifice. And you have to be uh, aware that what's coming instead, verse 27, is a terrifying expectation of judgment. What does remain? If there's no sacrifice remaining, what does remain? The prospect 
of judgment. Expectation doesn't mean, oh, the apostate's looking forward to it. Uh, No, it just means that all there is as you look forward in that one's life is the prospect of God's fury. The author here is quoting a couple of Old Testament texts that speak of the jealousy or the zeal of fire of Yahweh that will consume his enemies. And that is a startling word, adversaries, at the end of verse 27. Because the one who has professed faith in Christ, who has walked with Jesus for a time, who associated with God's people for a time, and then walks away, find himself actually to be an enemy of God. And all the armory of God aimed against him. This is a terrifying reality. Gradual drifting can lead to outright departure. Negligence in drawing near to God, holding tight to hope, and stirring each other up is the highway to apostasy. To forsake the assembly, to reject the encouragement of brothers, is to put your feet on the path that leads to eternal destruction. That's the point of this passage. If you reject Christ in this life, do you think that when you are in hell, under the judgment of God, that Christ will arrive again to die for you? Not a chance. There is no second chance. And let me just encourage those of us who are faint of heart, who tremble because of our own sin. uh, the, The reality is the closer you get to Christ, the more aware you become of your sin. Old, saintly Christians who don't sin very much anymore feel their sin more than anybody else. And so if you're close to Christ and you're tenderhearted and you feel the weight of your sin, listen carefully. The apostate does not care. He is not worried about the prospect of judgment. You can give all the warnings you want and he says, it's not true. I don't believe it. Been there, done that. Forget it. If you're trembling over your sin, if you fear falling away, if you're, if you're singing Keith's green song in your head, I don't want to fall away from you. This probably doesn't apply to you. The, 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 the state of the apostate. But what does apply in this passage is the warning. Tremble, Christian. Stay close to Christ. Boldly access the throne of grace through the way purchased by Jesus by his blood. These warnings are designed by God to stir up diligence in us individually and diligence with one another corporately. Diligence in our faith, our hope, and our love. I'm going to pray. Omri's going to come up and talk about how we do that practically as a local church through church membership. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your kindness to give us warnings. Let us fear, let us examine ourselves, let us tremble in all the ways that we should, and let us, with full assurance of faith, draw near to you through the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray that every believer here this morning would have that full assurance, that confidence, that what faith brings is true, glorious access to you and all of your goodness and forgiveness of sin, past, present, and future. May we glory in the reality that all those who are in you stand as perfect, even us who are still yet being sanctified. And so we ask now as we bring new members into this church that we would live up to these commands for one another, for your glory and for the good of your church, for the testimony of the power of the gospel in Jesus name. Amen.